Welcome to Frontlines. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across the United States and Canada, throughout Europe and the Middle East, to South, from South America to Australia, and of course, in Armenia and Artsakh. We were on a brief hiatus with the passing of Garo's father. Of course, our condolences to him and his family from everybody here at Frontlines, and we are extremely pleased uh, to be back. It is Armenian Independence Day in Armenia, and we congratulate our people in Armenia, in Artsakh, and around the world for their sacrifices in maintaining 30 years of statehood, for giving sons, husbands, brothers in defense of that statehood, and for the resilience of Armenian families who paid the ultimate price for survival of the Armenian homeland. This year's anniversary is a heavy one, and the struggle is clearly not over. And we've learned that wars are fought on many, many fronts, on battlefields, in sovereign skies, in press rooms, on social media, in diplomatic circles, in history books, and today, even in courtrooms across the world. We've been successful on the legal fronts, and we've had young war heroes in the legal fights and in human rights in Armenia. I'm naming just a few that have appeared on this show, Levon Kevotyan, Siran Sahagyan, of course, Arman Tatoyan, and on the human rights front in Artsakh, Artak Beklarian, Keram Stepanian, Armin Aleksanian, and of course, David Pabayan. And there are others on so many fronts, in so many places, working with such devotion and consistency. We have historians, we have writers, cultural heritage experts, experts on human, uh, humanitarian law and, and human, law, uh, hum, uh, human rights law. The list can go on and on, but clearly, we have done something unique as an Armenian nation in our legal struggles and our human rights efforts in international courts and international tribunals. Many, uh, many simply refuse to lay down the torch and know that we must carry on. And, and I really have to say that there is true greatness among our people. Those of you who follow us on front lines know that we describe what we do here as conversations about law, human rights, and the Armenian experience. Only days ago, Armenia filed an action against Azerbaijan in the International Court of Justice, the World Court at The Hague. Here to discuss the case with us is one of those Armenian lawyer heroes under whose direction and leadership Armenia has had, has, Armenia has had a number of successes before international courts and tribunals, and now the designated representative of the Republic of, Ar of Armenia before the ICJ. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Garo to introduce our guest. Thank you, Karnik. Parilus Sirele Harinagisner Arsachimech, Ayastanimech, Yevhamain Svirkimech. Good morning in Arsach and Armenia and throughout the diaspora. Good day and good evening in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York and beyond. Independence Day, 30 years ago today, the Republic of Armenia declared its independence for the second time in the 20th century succeeding the first independence of 1918. Today, we're gonna to talk about what Independence Day really means with someone whose work product is the epitome of true freedom, which is accepting and believing that you and you alone must be responsible for the destiny of your independent sovereign country, Republic of Armenia. There's been many, many, many commentaries, talk, back talk about the matter of Republic of Armenia versus Azerbaijan in the International Criminal Court of Justice at The Hague. Our dear friend and a scholar and a true, true champion of human rights and civil rights and all rights Republic of Armenia, Yeri Shegiragosyan, is our honored guest at this moment with us live from Yerevan. Who is Yeri Shegiragosyan for those of you who don't know about Yeri Shegiragosyan? He is the representative of Armenia before the European Court of Human Rights, and he is the agent and representative before the International Criminal Court of Justice. He has extensive experience of working with the government since 2008 in the capacity of an assistant to the prime minister then, later as deputy minister of justice. Yerisha Giragosyan has been teaching since 2006 after defending his PhD thesis which was entitled Custom in Contemporary International Law. Courses taught by Yeri Shagiragosian include public international law, precedent in international law, international courts and arbitration. 
Mr. Giragosian's research and academic focus includes international courts and arbitration, responsibility in international law, countermeasure and enforcement of international law. You notice I say international law quite often. His higher education, 2018 Master of Science of Law, Stanford Law School. 2010 Master of Laws in International Legal Studies, LLM, Georgetown University Law Center. 2006 PhD in International Law, Yerevan State University. 2004 Master's Degree in Jurisprudence, International Law, Yerevan State University. 2002 Bachelor's Degree in Jurisprudence, Yerevan State University. And here are the course, courses that are essentially taught over and over again. I could sum it up by three words, public international law. Those are the courses that are taught over and over again by the none other than one and only Yerisha Giragosian to a generation of new soldiers and advocates of Armenian rights. His publications are several, I'll list a few. He's the founder and editor in chief of the Armenian Yearbook of International and Comparative Law, which has been published since 2013. He is the editor of proceedings of the conference devoted to the 80th anniversary of Yerevan State University Faculty of Law, Yerevan State University Press 2014, and Custom in Contemporary International Law, Yerevan State University Press 2009 in Russian. The previous one I listed was in English. I can go on and on, but then we'll spend an hour talking about Yerisha's credentials. Why don't we spend the next hour talking about what Yerisha is up to? Yerisha, Pariye Gazes, Sireli Ekbar. Karnik. Thank you, Yerisha, for joining us. Um, I want to begin with uh, really just asking you to, to speak of the parameters, the substantive parameters of the case, introduce the case to our viewers, some of whom are lawyers, some of who are, are, uh, are not lawyers uh, interested in human rights. Uh, but uh, if you can give us a substantive overview about what was filed, um, where it was filed, and under what substantive grounds it was filed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karnik. Thank you, Carl, uh, for the nice words and for introduction. I appreciate that. And um, thanks for inviting uh, um, uh, to this session. And I hope that we'll be able to elaborate enough uh, to, um, uh, to provide the necessary information and message to, to the public and to the diaspora and to all Armenians across and not only Armenians who are reviewing this session. Uh, it is it is indeed a I think historic moment for for the country since um, we have um, brought the case uh, to the International Court of Justice um, to which uh, uh, I think Armenia has I think it's it, it, it is uh, it's a moment that Armenia has been um, uh, going through that or going to in that direction for for many years that's my understanding. But the thing is that uh, we never have been so active in using international legal tools. And unfortunately, the consequences of the recent war uh, uh, like accelerated many things, including the uh, use of the international legal tools, starting with the European Court of Human Rights, then, uh, which has been uh, used extensively for the past um, almost a year. And uh, it continues to uh, entertain the cases that has been, have been filed by Armenia now. And about the, uh, the case filed at the ICJ, um, it is quite, I think it's, it is, um, the application of course is available online, uh, the website of the court. The case has been filed based on the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which is uh, fundamental uh, human rights treaty uh, accepted and adopted in the framework of the UN. And it encompasses a number of very important and fundamental uh, commitments for member states. It is considered to be uh, a treaty which, um, uh, which creates obligations, so-called erga omnes uh, partes, which is meaning that the uh, obligations under this treaty are owed to the international community as a whole. Under uh, and in, in this in this case, if we're speaking about their common partners, it means 
the uh, obligations under the treaty are owed to all state parties to that treaty. And uh, the uh, case has been brought based on the Article 22 of uh, this very uh, treaty, the convention, which allows uh, the adjudication or, or creates the jurisdictional basis for the International Court of Justice to hear the case, uh, any, any case or any dispute that parties may have about the interpretation and application of the provisions uh, of this convention. It, this is a very uh, widespread uh, type of uh, clause uh, across many uh, international human rights treaties. This is in, in, in international legal terminology, this is called compromissory clause. This compromissory clause are granting a treaty based jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice uh, in cases when parties are having some um, uh, disputes or um, disagreements with regard to interpretation application of uh, certain provisions of the Commission, they're bringing the case before the court. We have uh, witnessed the use of this very uh, tool, uh, I mean, this very convention by uh, other countries too. I mean, starting from, uh, uh, from Georgia, uh, Georgia against Russia case. So that's a famous case, which was again based on this very convention. Then moving to Qatar, UAE. Then oh, we have uh, a pending example, which is uh, uh, Ukraine, Russia. That's, uh, and we have uh, the judgment on the preliminary objections by the court in that case. And the court is now preliminary objections judgments, meaning that the court has uh, affirm that it has jurisdiction over the case, and now it's uh, considering the merits of the case. Uh, like turning to the uh, just uh, turning to the content of the application. I mean, uh, this um, and the um, uh, the, uh, the uh, application encompasses like a very wide 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 area of uh, violations that have taken place um, and. Um, if I may, uh, you know, if, sure. if I may, yeah, just before we get into the substance, there have been a lot of questions uh, as the, the case has uh, gone public. Uh, there, have been, there have been quite a number of questions regarding the jurisdictional point that you mentioned. And, uh, and those that perhaps don't have experience in public international law um, have been making statements such as, you know, whether or not, what is the basis of consent for jurisdiction. You raised a point, and I wanted you to highlight that a little bit more, um, and that this action is a treaty-based action by virtue, again, in layman's terms, by virtue of consenting and, and, uh, and ratifying this treaty. There are procedures in place, correct, sure. is that the understanding, that, uh, that allow for jurisdiction to resolve these disputes. If you can kind of highlight that a little bit and maybe discuss what some of those procedures are. Yeah, of course. Um, um, I'll, I'll highlight that. I can, I can, I can zoom zoom out a bit more. I mean, I, mm -hmm. in terms of the jurisdiction of the court, if that's necessary, because I understand that the uh, nuances of the jurisdiction of International Court of Justice are a little bit uh, specific. I think in terms that you need to be an international lawyer to understand the nuances of the jurisdiction of the court. The court usually takes the cases uh, in several uh, circumstances. Like first of all, when two disputing countries are agreeing to the jurisdiction of the mm -hmm. court and transferring the dispute to the court for consideration, that's the first uh, like uh, circ like first um, condition, like or first uh, type of the jurisdiction. Then you have a case when there is a treaty which provides a jurisdictional clause, and based on that jurisdictional clause any of the disputing parties can bring the case to the court or in front of the court. And uh, that's also a basis for jurisdiction. And the third option, that's not our case, but just uh, generally for the public to know, there is this uh, so-called uh, uh, the uh, jurisdictional uh, declarations that are being made, unilateral declarations by member states, uh, accepting the jurisdiction of the court open-ended uh, in the future. And, and if there are like two such countries which have made uh, such unilateral uh, declarations, then the court can entertain the case. But our our case, like our case, has been brought uh, based on the treaty clause, which is uh, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. 
which uh, has Article 22. And Article 22 uh, reads as follows. I can read the uh, entire sure. wording of the article so that uh, everyone is on the same page. Any dispute between two or more state parties with respect to the interpretation or application of this convention, which is not settled by negotiation or, or by the procedures expressly provided for in this convention, shall, at the request of any of the parties to the dispute, be referred to the International Court of Justice for a decision, unless the disputants agree to another mode of settlement. This is the clause, this is the compromissory clause, uh, which is enshrined under the convention. And uh, here uh, we, have, we, we, we have met the requirements provided in that article. And after meeting that requirement, we have made or we have filed the application to the court. Meaning um, uh, when we're saying uh, have uh, met the requirements, I mean, uh, you, you see that there is a precondition of negotiation and precondition or using of uh, the procedures provided by the convention itself. Because the convention also provides procedures uh, 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 in the committee on elimination of racial discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, which has not, which is not the case. Uh, we're speaking about the precondition of negotiation, which has been fulfilled already. So uh, now we are moving. Uh, so now the dispute has moved to the court, which means that the court will start adjudicating the dispute. And note that uh, Armenia not only filed an application instituting proceedings before the court, but I may also filed a request for provision of measures uh, to be applied by the court, which is uh, important here to underline that uh, Armenia uh, uh, emphasizes the urgency of the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, meaning that uh, we think that the, um, and it is actually stemming from the preamble of the convention itself, that provides that all member states should uh, um, should take necessary measures uh, to uh, uh, speedily speedily eliminating racial discrimination throughout the world. I mean, this is a, a, a purpose of the convention, and meaning that any action, any conduct of a state party that amounts to racial discrimination which is our case. We're witnessing such violations every day happening. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Yenishay. Uh, I, no, I am uh, itching uh, to get a lot of these things because uh, I, I want to talk sure. about this. I, I, I read this document more than once. Uh, it's a work of art. It's, it's 59 pages of substance. Uh, and I, and I want to say a few things about it and ask you to comment on those, but there's so many things I want to say so that I, I want to get my thoughts, you comment and we just keep going. Sure. Um, so let's, let's do this. Uh, let's first start by answering to those naysayers who talk about, uh, you know, regardless of the legal basis of this document, uh, filing this document is a quote waste of time unquote uh, that you know you win your lands back by war by uh, Zenkov which you know has its place but explain explain if you may to those people that when you file a case called an international court of justice republic of armenia versus Republic of Azerbaijan, and you label it volume one, that means there's another volume coming, correct? Yeah? Uh, yep. and, and then the first six, six areas that you bring to the court's attention are hate speech, number one, Azerbaijan's atrocities and policy of ethnic cleansing. Number three, condoning and rewarding of atrocities against Armenians, number Four, denial of other individual rights and daily discrimination against Armenians. Number five, destruction of Armenian cultural heritage and history. And number six, failure to take necessary and effective measures to eliminate racial discrimination. What are you trying to accomplish, Yerisha? 
Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Cara. Thank you very much, Cara. Uh, I think it is it's an excellent question. And um, uh, let me start from uh, just reacting to the skeptics. I think that will bring bring me to the uh, substance of the application. And uh, of course, there are skeptics, and I've um, I've heard many also. Um, and I was looking in. Uh, I was I was waiting, or I was seeing that this will come. After even after the filing, I think I know that there will be people who will disagree with this uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, step. But uh, this is this is a little bit unfortunate. I think the filing of the case uh, doesn't uh, necessarily uh, preclude any other uh, uh, or um, any other measures, mode of remedies. Different measures, the remedies that we should undertake as a country. Of course, we will. I think of course we will be we'll, we'll, we'll resort to our right to self defense under international mm -hmm. law. That's 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 a given. That's uh, nothing disputed. But the thing is that my understanding is that when the country files a case, it's not only uh, looking forward to get some remedies, in, in, in meaning that it's not only looking to hold accountable for a country and other countries which is responsible for those violations, including the acknowledgement of the violation and compensation um, and, 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 and other remedies, meaning like restitutions uh, or restoring the uh, status quo ante. But uh, the, other, the other important issue that, uh, that when a country brings a claim, it means the country expresses a position. The country mm -hmm. expresses a position under international law, a country expresses it's a very, uh, 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 a very strict position, meaning that it has uh, some grievances under international law. It speaks in the language of international community, and this is a civilized method of bringing up these grievances under to the to the to the highest uh, highest judicial uh, body of the of the world, and mm -hmm. which means that uh, the gravity of the situation is of such of such a high. Uh, Degree that a country brings this to the court, and I think not bringing such grievance and just sitting there, I think it will be quite very wrong to do that. It means that you will not have any uh, uh, discernible position to express, and the countries will not get what your position is there uh, on on that matter on, on this matter is. And being a sovereign state, being a member of the international community, this is a very important step that countries should make. And I've been preaching for this for quite many uh, years now, since I know uh, being being coming from from international law background, I know that's how important it is to utilize the toolkit uh, the international law provides. And by that, you are uh, by doing that, you are strengthening your sovereignty. That's my perception. By every step that you are doing, that you are strengthening your sovereignty more and more. And that's uh, that's a very and you are getting more. Um, a more uh, uh, a better perceived by other members of the international community. And uh, what are we getting at by filing this case? Of course, we're bringing up these violations. We won't, uh, we are the, one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, very near uh, purposes, like uh, not sh short term purposes, let's put it in that way, short or mid term purposes is to uh, force uh, Azerbaijan to uh, seize the violations that are still continuing to happen. That's why the uh, country has um, has requested a provisional measure to be applied by the court, which includes uh, like hate speech that we're receiving every day. The hate speech is coming from the highest level, highest political level from that country. And the hate speech in itself uh, is not helping uh, the security or preserving the security on the ground in the region. And I think in a way, uh, the filing of this case is also aimed at securing or trying to secure or trying to create another layer of uh, restraint on the country who is trying to uh, uh, violate the security or, to, or uh, escalate the situation on the ground. And I think that's also another important aspect because in any way uh, where uh, this is uh, highlighting this, uh, uh, highlighting the moment. And um, uh, I think uh, not only to stop, uh, stop uh, conduct which is in breach of the convention, but also we want, because uh, the, 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 the sections that you just read, uh, Caro, I think the hate speech, the, the rewarding, uh, condoning and rewarding uh, of uh, hate crime uh, by perpetrators or denial of the rights of certain rights, and then going to the destruction of cultural heritage, that those are highly interconnected pieces of, uh, of uh, or no, 
as, uh, aspects of different aspects of the racial discrimination that are being there because the hate speech is propelling this violation from happening. Right? The hate speech creates the atmosphere, the atmosphere of um, uh, lawlessness or the atmosphere that there will be no punishment for this kind of crimes. I mean, hate crimes, hate speech against ethnic Armenians. The condoning or rewarding emphasizes that it's, it's vice versa. It's just idolizing people who are committing like hate crimes, like Ramil Safara from getting rewarded, right. or other uh, officers who, uh, who who beheaded, for example, Armenian servicemen. That's also another example. But then the denial, the, 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 the denial of the rights is the consequence of all of this, because like if you will not have any rights if you are living in such uh, an atmosphere where any ethnic Armenians will be denied the entry, uh, like the right to access to cultural heritage. And the destruction of cultural heritage part is a very, is a very important aspect since uh, what we have been witnessing for the past decades, for the past uh, yeah, many decades, that uh, there has been an attempt to uh, falsify the history. There has been an attempt to create a history by erasing Armenian footprint on in the region. Which is so let's very, talk about the yeah. relief. Yerisha, uh, forgive me, Carly. Sure. I want to follow up real quick. Let's talk about the relief sought because in the, and I really like this work, work product. I, I have to, I, I cannot compliment you and your colleagues enough on it. I really think it's with all of the citations uh, to the cases uh, and I've pulled out a few of them the last couple of days. Um, it, it's really, uh, 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 something to be proud of. Uh, you talked about the relief sought in this in this uh, initial application. In the relief sought, <clears throat> and there are there are I believe uh, 10, 10 areas under um, one of the sections uh, which which talk about cease forthwith any such ongoing internationally wrongful act. And fully comply with the obligations under articles two, three, four, five, six, and seven of the CERD, C E R D, which I want you to tell the audience what that means. But here's the 10. The first one talks about refraining from practices of ethnic cleansing against Armenians. The second one, refraining from engaging in terms of what you just referred to, glorifying, etc., the remote Ramil Safarovs of the world, of the Azerbaijani universe, if you will, the parallel universe that they seem to be living in. Refraining from engaging or tolerating the hate speech, refraining from suppressing the Armenian language. You got about six refrainings here. Then you have punishing, punishing all acts of racial discrimination, public and private, against Armenians. You have, you have a section that seeks a remedy to ensure the rights of Armenians, including, and this is very important and I commend you, including the Armenian prisoners of war. So in this instance, <clears throat> you've now taken the plight of the rights of the Armenian prisoners of war, many of whom are civilians, many of whom were captured after the so-called document uh, to cease hostilities of November 9th. You've taken it to the highest court in the world, International Court of Justice. So to the extent that you know, you're also seeking adopting of laws to, uh, necessary, to, uh, to uphold the obligations, providing Armenians with equal treatment, refraining uh, from hindering the registration and operation of NGOs, uh, you know, and arresting, detaining, sent uh, and sentencing human rights activists that's been going on and taking effective measures. So tell us about what CERD is and tell us if your remedy sought, the 10 that I just quickly glanced over, is granted what occurs. Is that a is that a judgment by the International Court of Justice that Azerbaijan failing to abide will have consequences? And if so, what consequences? Thank you, Gara. Thanks a lot for the question. I think, um, yeah, the relief sought uh, encompasses the, uh, the full uh, spectrum of the application. I mean, trying to um, uh, I present in different aspects, how we see this commitment uh, materialized in reality, because under, under the under the third, uh, you had certain commitments, and of course, the, you have the refraining part, of course, which is uh, relating to the ongoing process or ongoing violations that are continuing to happen, 
And then uh, we have the punishing part, of course, which is uh, again stemming an obligation stemming from the, the same convention and a positive obligation to punish those who are perpetrating hate crimes or hate speech, spreading hate speech and are treating uh, inhumanly, for example, the captives or the army and POWs based on a racial motive, which is the case here, because we have this racial motive, which is the hatred uh, based on the origin or descent or the national origin, origin adminophobia, which is widespreadly there. So this, this all uh, uh, like uh, uh, the prayer for relief or the request, uh, the uh, uh, relief sought is very intertwined and it's very logically flowing, I think, as you may see there. And I think uh, uh, the, um, the, the issue of the captive, the issue of the others couldn't have been left out because this is uh, a, a big part of the, uh, a, a, this moment, uh, the violations that are currently occurring. And this is also emphasizing the urgency of the matter on one hand, like it is emphasizing that there are people there who are under captivity who are uh, being treated um, not in line with the conventional standards, including CERD, not only CERD, but also generally international law. So we well, should have brought this issue there because this is this is a highly important issue. Of course, there is we have brought this issue, uh, the issue has been brought before the European Court of Human Rights, but the angle of bringing, uh, bringing this issue there is a little bit different there because we have brought under the uh, conventional rights uh, guaranteed, but here we're like emphasizing the CERD uh, angle of the issue, meaning the rest of the discriminatory angle of the issue. And um, I forgot the second part of your question, Karajan. Uh, 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 well, I, 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 I wanted to know if there's if there's going to be if there's going to be yes. uh, findings, what happens? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully they will. I think uh, there's still, I think, a lot of work ahead and I think the court should consider yeah. this uh, case and um, it will take, unfortunately, or it will take years. And so that's the that's how the court works. Of course, if we are looking into a more uh, swift move uh, by the court with regard to the provisional measure part, uh, I think that will happen in, in in coming months or even sooner. So, uh, but with regard to the adjudication of the case and finding or the violations or the relief sought there, that will happen uh, in in the years to come, and. Of course, we're looking into if the court finds that there is a violation or the or the or the reliefs is relief uh, relief so are ground uh, granted, and then I think what will happen, of course, that will, will mean that uh, Azerbaijan should be held accountable, meaning that it is responsible for the violations of the cert, and it should conduct in line uh, with those violations, and like the court should apply in several forms of international responsibility. It should be either reparation, uh, yeah, reparation. starting from the starting from the acknowledgement, which is should be in a form of, I think, apology. That's uh, that's 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 so called under international law terms. It's called satisfaction. That's mm -hmm. an acknowledgement and uh, apology for for the conduct, and also uh, restoration or restore uh, or restoring the status quo ante in some violations, which may be applicable to meaning that going back or uh, reversing the uh, situation if it's possible, or if it's not possible or it is possible, it can be con in conjunction with the compensation, which is also will be sought. Of course, that's that's a very important part of the uh, application that will come later on because. Note also that this application is just the beginning because the court will grant a time for the country to file its memorials, which will be uh, quite like much more extensive and will be coming with more evidentiary materials and so because this is just the beginning of the case. Yeah, so yes, I, that, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. I, I wanted to, to jump in here and just address a couple of points and then I have a, 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 a perhaps a more detailed question. But I, I think that for our viewers to really understand that this, we cannot underestimate the importance of this case. This is this truly is a historic case. Uh, it is a historic case in the making, and we're really witnessing it in real time. Um, to the question of its value, this is an exercise of sovereignty. As we see uh, issues and places where. Armenians throughout the world are wondering why uh, the government doesn't flex itself or flex its muscles here or there. This is exactly what 
the Republic of Armenia is doing here in that respect. It is exercising its own sovereignty. And that's an important, especially on this the 30th anniversary of statehood, to realize the value of exercising sovereignty. I want to point out that so that it doesn't get lost, and I'm kind of speaking to the non-lawyers uh, watching, um, the case involves obligations that Azerbaijan has committed itself to. It has promised to abide by certain obligations. And that's why I think is really powerful about this case is that the uh, Yerishe and his team have put it to the test to say, these are the obligations that the Republic of Azerbaijan has committed itself to under the, under the, uh, under CERD, um, and it has failed to do so. Uh, it has failed to live up to that. And the facts, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the facts, Yagesha, that underpin the case, because I have to say, I think it's really artfully done. Uh, the historical background digs deep into uh, to Azerbaijan's uh, consistent denial of genocide, uh, its, uh, its efforts uh, at, uh, at ethnic cleansing, the extensive uh, examples of hate speech, and in fact, racial hatred, acts of racial hate, uh, hate, hatred, and it really ties it in really well. And I, wanna, I want you to uh, tell us, just maybe taking a step back a little bit, about um, why it, it, we see, I think if we really think hard about it, whether it's the POW issue, whether it's the war, whether it's the treatment, uh, uh, treatment of Armenians on, in the border villages, whether it's the treatment of, of civilians, whether it's the discourse that we hear from the Azerbaijani government and its influence over other states. Um, this is that issue that underpins all of it, isn't it? I mean, this is we're, we're dealing with the core issue here of, of racial hatred and the uh, a commitment, if you will, by Azerbaijan uh, to act in a way that is contrary to its own international obligations. Um, if you can talk to us a little bit about why you feel that these uh, that CERD, uh, the convention itself, and the rights and the obligations that are protected by that convention are so powerful. Why are they powerful? And how do you see them uh, translating into a, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing today, perhaps the most uh, extreme sense, at least in our, in our, in our current environment, is the, uh, was, the, uh, uh, was the war itself and its aftermath. How does this feed into that? And what are your views on why, why this treaty substantively, why the values and how does it translate into all the, uh, the ill that we're seeing imposed on Armenians? Um, thank you. Thank you, Karnik. Uh, thanks uh, for the question. I think um, if, we, if we look back at the convention and see where this convention comes from, and it is one of the very first instruments that uh, have been created in the framework of the UN. I think it was opened for signature back in 1965. And mm -hmm. this is not a coincidence. And I think uh, why it's like, it, it, is, it is coming from a very troubled past. I think that's uh, after the Second World War. And I think what happened during the Second World War or, or in the, uh, just uh, right before the Second World War, I mean, or even, going back to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, I think that's uh, this, this convention is particularly emphasizing that point because we of course have the convention on the punishment of the crime of the genocide. But I think this convention is also an important tool for that because the uh, what is genocide? Genocide of course is uh, uh, the killing of the particular group uh, of persons belonging to a particular group. But here we also do have the uh, prohibition of racial discrimination, which mm -hmm. uh, encompasses, like, uh, under the convention, the term racial discrimination means uh, like any, uh, any distinction, exclusion, restriction, uh, preference based on race, color, descent, or national ethnic origin. So the and it goes on. I mean, like the uh, the uh, the importance of this convention is emphasized by itself, meaning that this is a uh, fundamental uh, guarantee for the human rights. And that's why this convention obligations are a gomnes partis and are creating, uh, are, most of them are peremptory norms of international law. And 
so my understanding and my perception is that because of this hatred, because of the uh, continued hate policy, but because of the continued uh, uh, hate speech and hate crimes being committed and not punished, and not not only not punished but rewarded, this is this has been this has created an utmost uh, situation of like uh, peril to the security in the region. And that perpetuates this war thing. I think the one of the causes, I think one of the fundamental causes of this violence happening on the ground, and violence against the civilians, violence against the captive POWs, is 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 based on this hatred. I mean, that's why this treaty should play a fundamental role and a commitment under the treaty should be a fundamental in preventing or uh, in the future. So, such violence because this the hatred or hate speech all the time perpetuates new, new crimes new types of uh, atrocities new types of <laughs> heinous crimes torture killings beheadings ritual killings etc so forth that's why this is a this is becoming a fundamental thing and this is uh, fundamental for the security of the group security of the nation security of the ethnic people uh, ethnic group and i think here, when people are saying that, oh, we should more for be focusing on uh, just taking up arms and going and fighting. Yes, of course, that's important to defend ourselves. But this this front, this 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 uh, type of action is also important because it creates also the legal rationale of all these things. You cannot go just do that without having this uh, document, without having this rationale uh, or justification based on which you are doing that. The cause. This is the cause. Mm -hmm. You have to create that. You are a sovereign state. You are uh, living in the international community. You, you should not just, you, sh you should play by rules. You should use these tools. And I think uh, yeah. these countries as Armenia are like, should do that because otherwise uh, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot, um, you cannot survive. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, if I may, uh, sure. you, you put in the application atrocities committed, vivid examples, such as the so-called military trophies park as an indicia of, uh, of the insensitivity uh, and the ongoing, um, ongoing manifestations of armenophobia by the highest levels of uh, the so-called Republic of Azerbaijan. You then sought provisional measures <clears throat> to protect and preserve Armenia's rights and the rights of Armenians from further harm. To the extent that under third, Azerbaijan has, as you have put in your application, has undertaken the, to respect the right of Armenians to enjoy without distinction as to their national or ethnic origin, security of their person and protection by the state against violence or bodily threat. You then suggest to the court you're telling the International Court of Justice, the court has the power to indicate if it considers that circumstances so require any provisional measures which ought to be taken to preserve the respective rights of either party. And then you, this is what, this is what really made me think, the court is not called upon to determine definitively whether the rights of, whether the rights that Armenia seeks to protect exist, Instead, it, it need only decide whether the rights claimed by Armenia on the merits and for which it is seeking protection are plausible and linked to the provisional measures requested. That is very important distinction for us practicing attorneys. You're, you're basically citing appropriate uh, precedent, letting the court know that look, if that which we are saying is so much as plausible, and of course all of us, uh, the three of us here and many uh, in the audience and elsewhere know it's beyond plausible, but the court's standard is just plausibility. And then if so, then the provisional measures will kick in. Now the provisional measures, am I correct? That would then compel the court to make such uh, findings, which will then force Azerbaijan to cease and desist from continuing its ongoing practice, if you will, 
that we are all uh, witnessing every day uh, throughout the globe. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Uh, an excellent point, I think. Uh, this is this is uh, the uh, of course the jurisdictional provisional measures is a little bit different than uh, the jurisdiction or the issue that will be discussed uh, on merits mm -hmm. or later on by the court. And then, and of course, the standards are a little bit different here, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why that's why you saw that the uh, there has been references to the relevant case law of the court uh, regard to the standards that should be applied by the court when deciding whether to apply the provisional measure or not. Meaning that, including that, uh, should be plausible, like what uh, right. the, the rights we should uh, seeking protection should be plausible. And I think that that the same goes for also the uh, entire like. Uh, uh, for the jurisdiction of the court, for example, when the court is deciding on provisional measures, the court should decide whether it has prima facie jurisdiction, not, not only going deep into this, uh, diving into the question, discussing it right. ex in extensively, but it should has, uh, have that determination at first thing. Quite. The, the same goes for the right protector, because you're bringing in a, what we're doing now here, we're bringing an example, a very uh, flagrant examples of violations are, are occurring today, like the uh, military trophy spark is one of these high, uh, like uh, highly, um, I don't know, um, telling uh, visible, yes, yeah, it's like really visible, uh, visible instances of violation of this convention, which are going against the spirit, not only spirit, but purpose and object of the three. And uh, and that they are creating this atmosphere, they are really propelling this atmosphere of the hatred in which, of course, you will not have any 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 possible security for the person or right for security for the person guaranteed under the convention, which means that any person in that atmosphere will be uh, prone to be uh, subjected to any like types of mistreatment and et cetera and so forth. So that's why this is a measure that we request. Uh, it is more than plausible. I think that here right. <laughs> we are, yes, I think it's, it's even more than plausible. So we request the court to take up on this, I think, to uh, where that we're respecting the suspension or terminate, like closure of this park, at least, uh, so so that the court will have the opportunity to entertain the case, because you cannot start discussing the case without discussing the um, this uh, this very circumstance, this very evidence which violates or breaches the convention every day as we speak. And this also adds the urgency to the case. Um, it also adds the rationale why the Republic of Armenia has requested provisional measures to be applied in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, uh, we, we're confident in this uh, I think request, we're confident in the, in the application that has been filed. And I think uh, we'll see, we'll look forward into that, of course, uh, but uh, the country is highly confident in that. Uh, if, if we can discuss real to the extent that you can, uh, I think it's a it's a question probably burning on the minds of a lot of viewers. What has been uh, the reaction from really two different sources? Uh, what has been the reaction to the extent that you can say uh, from Azerbaijan? Uh, what has been the reaction from the international legal community with respect to res with respect to the application to the extent that that you can speak of, um, obviously. Um, what, how has the application been received thus far? Um, of course, we've got the reaction uh, from the Azerbaijani side as soon as the application was filed, and uh, you've got the official reaction that they will come um, with, a, with their own application. We'll see. I don't know. That's, we'll look forward. We'll see what, what kind of application they're going uh, to, uh, to file. And of course, there has been also a mention that uh, it's going to uh, be connected with the uh, with the landmines situation, but we'll see what what will come. But I, I don't want to comment on that until I see the actual application. Of course. So that will be better to wait whenever they file, if they file, whatever yeah. they file. And based on that, we'll try to understand how we're going to do with that. And, but overall, I think uh, what we have been receiving so far from, I think, our partners and our friends, that the, 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 the reactions are quite positive. And that uh, this kind of action undertaken by the country is highly important and it should be done. I think 
most of the civilized world, like, like representatives of different countries, expert communities, I think are reacting in a, in a very positive manner, which I think was expected to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And 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 the other side, procedurally, um, you know, I guess from a just to take a step back and just in terms of the process now that the application is filed, yes, we have the provisional measure, measures. When and uh, you said that the process is a long process. Just for our viewers to kind of understand the life of this case, um, what are the next stages? Uh, what do you expect to see procedurally? Um, uh, again, without getting into the substance of the of, of upcoming arguments and things of that nature, but procedurally, what do you expect to see and when, um, and how how do you expect the case to proceed procedurally? Uh, the 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 nearest point procedurally that we're looking into now, we're waiting uh, to see is the hearing, uh, upcoming hearing with regard to our request on provisional measures. Uh, we have we don't have any certainty there, but I think it should be quite soon. I don't think that will take much of time. That's the most nearest procedural point that we're mm -hmm. uh, we are looking into now. And of course, uh, the next steps of procedural will depend on the uh, on the filings that Azerbaijan will do. I think that's also important. So, including the jurisdictional phases and other phases that will face or not. Yeah. And and also for there there were uh, quite a few inquiries. Uh, Yerish uh, to Karnig and I uh, prior to us going live by by those who um, view front lines, if you will, regularly. And there was a question about uh, whether or not uh, you in your capacity as a representative, uh, the, the application in its, uh, in its contents uh, can or does it touch upon uh, the violations uh, that have taken place and suffered uh, by our compatriots, the Armenians of Artsakh. And, and I'm uh, pleased to uh, let uh, those who inquired along those lines that uh, it's very well set out in, in pages 46 and 47 of the application, uh, starting actually with page 47, destruction of Armenian cultural heritage, uh, the references to the uh, so-called willingness of Azerbaijan's uh, uh, disingenuous uh, their willingness to allow UNESCO to visit and, and not allow them to visit. And then the example of the 200 year old St. John the Baptist Church in Shushi uh, and uh, more commonly known as the Green Chapel, uh, obviously, and, and many, other, uh, many other references. So my understanding is when you refer to Armenia, well, that's a clear understanding what that is. When you refer to Armenians, that also applies to Armenians uh, of Artsakh in terms of the obligations that Azerbaijan has internationally. Am I mistaken or am I correct? You're absolutely correct. I think when we're referring to uh, Armenians, it includes Armenians yeah. across the globe. I think including Armenians even living in diaspora to uh, yes. Armenians living in Artsakh, Armenians living in Armenia. And I think that's uh, I think the hatred and also you know, the discrimination against ethnic Armenians. Uh, mm -hmm. It is widespread and it, it, it touches every Armenian. And uh, so, yes, it includes uh, Armenians in Artsakh. And of course, in many aspects, not, not only the Part that you just pointed out re relating to the um, destruction of the culture and religious sites, but also uh, any uh, many many other rights guaranteed under the convention also touched upon. I think where uh, a lot of evidence has been presented of the violations of the rights during the 44-day war and in the aftermath of that, and I think that still we will be we will we will um, uh, we will file a lot of more evidence that's uh, still are now on, in the process of. Um, uh, 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 we are processing that right now, and I think we'll uh, we'll still have time. But yes, that includes that we are Armenian, and all of them, because the victims of this violation of this type of violation are the ethnic Armenians. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to to identify one uh, a thing uh, a specific point from the uh, from the application. I think that's really worth discussing, and and I kind of alluded to it when we kind of opened the program today. Um, and that is in terms of, you know, one glance at the footnotes and reading through the footnotes, 
it really does uh, not only buttress the substance of the application, but it also shows the value uh, of numerous people that have contributed to fact finding, that have contributed in terms of reports, in terms of reporting, in terms of scholarship. And I, and I, and I must say, not only in the immediate period, but going back several decades. And, and I think that that's really, a, a, you know, an important, uh, important piece to really, and the names obviously with 200 plus footnotes is, is, is not something we're going to recite here. Uh, but I do encourage our viewers to read, to really understand, read and really understand what this application is, uh, is aiming to do. And you will see the value that was been created. And I wanted Yegesha, if you would, to kind of discuss if, uh, if you can, some of those factual sources, uh, the information, uh, the gathering process, if you will, and perhaps even what your personal impressions were re with respect to the amount of scholarship. Uh, some of the names are people that have been on our program. A lot of them, in fact, have been on our program. Um, and still others uh, are really, um, uh, I would say, historic and important names in the history of, you know, Armenian rights and Armenian, uh, in, in Armenian history per se. Um, and, and I think that it really shows uh, the depth by which the application was prepared, but also really shows the value of that work. And I wanted to get your impressions um, on the fact gathering, um, as well as uh, perhaps personally what you feel with respect to the, the contributions of so many in terms of the, um, the, uh, the factual research um, that had been done over the course of many decades and especially over the course of the last year. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, yeah, you 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 are uh, you're, you 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 notice uh, you notice that it's very important that you're bringing this up. I think the application in itself, the factual background, and the uh, the research that is referring to are highly important in the structure of the application. It starts with the uh, with different uh, uh, authors who authored a really important. Uh, important monographs, books, and uh, research and analysis, which are cited in the, in, in the application. And uh, the, um, I think that there are many names that uh, like also Armenian and non-Armenian names and uh, which have contributed to the development of this course because we are going back in a very, uh, not only to the immediate past, but we're going back to the beginning of the 20th century. If you have seen the, the application, which is creating the baseline and creating the contextual uh, context necessary to understand what happens, what, what's happening and why it is happening. Because mm -hmm. we, we needed to go back that far to create this, like uh, the understanding for the reader, uh, for a reader who doesn't know uh, much about Armenia or Armenians to uh, have uh, an, a better understanding when reading the application, the context and the contextuality is necessary to understand all of this rationale behind that. And of course, that's uh, the references uh, going back, I include many authors. I, I, I can't name one because there are so many and uh, all of them are important, I think. And of course, we're also, with regard to ongoing violations, we are uh, working, we have been working tightly with our colleagues so now, and I think Mr. Arman Tatoyan, for example, mm -hmm. his reports have been cited quite extensively in, uh, in, 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 in throughout the application, our valuable source of uh, evidentiary materials. And, uh, and of course, uh, reports by uh, the Ombudsman of Artsakh and uh, of course, many uh, other independent human rights organizations which have been conducting uh, research in the area and reports uh, to their reports and many, many other individuals who have been contributing to this. And I think it's, it, is, it, it is still ongoing, this evidentiary uh, work. It's a, it's a massive work and I think when we're working it has been, uh, it, it's ongoing and, um, and uh, of course, uh, um, there's still a lot to come. I think it's just the beginning because we, um, yeah. And I, yeah, and I, and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, having interviewed um, a number of uh, cultural heritage experts, human rights experts, Arman uh, Tatoyan, of course, uh, as well as the ombudsman, 
uh, Keram and Artak before him, uh, Beglarian uh, from, Art, uh, from Artsakh. Clearly throughout the, uh, throughout the war, we all understood the value of the evidentiary material that they were collecting, the depth and professionalism with which they did so. Um, and I, I commend you, uh, Yerishe, for giving voice to those facts. It is uh, one of the uh, perhaps travesties of our history that we have amassed facts and facts and facts, but we've been unable to voice those facts, voice those facts to a tribunal that is charged with having to consider them. And I think that that's why I say that the, the work uh, that, that you've undertaken here um, is a historic is a historic undertaking. It's a historic undertaking because finally we are giving voice to the reality. We're giving voice to the reality that we've experienced, that our people have experienced. And what's amazing about the way it's couched in this claim, in, in this application, is that it, there is a continuum. There is a marked continuum that if you read the story, as, as uh, any judge would read a story, it, it tells the story of not, I, I don't want to use the word suffering, I, it tells the story of violation of basic human rights, of, of basic understandings of how civil society, how the civil world has promised to interact with one another. Um, and I think you've done a tremendously amazing job at, at drawing those, giving those factual um, uh, underpinnings um, a place to be heard in the context where it has, it makes a difference moving forward. And I want to just kind of in closing, I know we're, we're up on our hour and I know that, um, you know, we promised to, to try to keep it uh, within an hour. Um, I wanted just to ask you to touch diplomatically from an international law perspective, not necessarily just with this case, the impact that a case like this and hopefully down the road, a judgment has on diplomacy, has on international relations among states, because these are some of the perhaps not tactile results that come from international litigation like this. Uh, and I wanted you to, to talk about that, if you would, um, just briefly about what those diplomatic, um, uh, the diplomatic uh, impact uh, impacts can be of cases, um, as well as their uh, role in uh, international relations generally. Thank you, thank you, Karnak Jan. I think um, the it's uh, the the preparation of the application actually itself. It's a uh, it's a work of a, it's a teamwork, a uh, result of a teamwork, and uh, a lot of effort has been put into that, and including our councils, including our team in, in Yerevan. And uh, I'll try uh, with regard to the impact that this kind of litigation uh, will have um, or is having. I think it is it, it will be a long-standing impact. That's my understanding, and um, uh, it will. It, it, will, it will add up a lot of content uh, and substance to the work that uh, the, uh, our diplomats will be doing uh, in, throughout the course of this case, and which I'm sure that it will help them to address uh, many issues in, more, in a more targeted manner. And it will, uh, I think, um, uh, help them or strengthen their word because uh, a lot of substance is in the application itself and it will come mm -hmm. later on in different procedural formats. And uh, that's uh, a lot of evidentiary materials which are there to help also to provide all the evidence, evidence with regard to the violations by Azerbaijan being committed, continuing to be committed. and. Uh, to bring that to the attention of the international community, not only in the court, but also outside the court, because uh, those are highly important. So the impact, I think, will be immense. I think a lot of uh, that will be happening. So, which means that uh, not only the work is, uh, is, is, being, is expected to be conducted inside the courtroom, but also it is expected to be done outside the courtroom. And, uh, and which is highly important in this matter. And uh, what we have did, what we did, I think, by filing this, this kind of claim before the World Court 
is that we send a really bold message to the international community already that uh, Armenia as uh, Armenia is a civilized nation, Armenia is a civilized member of the international community, and it uh, intends to in in enforce uh, enforce international instruments, international law, or fundamental principles of international law. That's a strong message. I think that's a very, and, and the and the application, as many of you have seen, I think Garo mentioned that he, he saw volume one. Yes, it's volume mm -hmm. one. And uh, the volume two are the annexes or the evidentiary materials which are supporting the application. So you should have seen, noticed in the references, references to annexes. And not all, not all of it is public. So uh, in any case, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the impact will be much, much uh, stronger. And uh, with this, with the filing of this case, I think a lot of work is still ahead. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it highly positive because we need to, we need to fight for our rights. We really need to put this forward. We really need to pursue this. And uh, I, I don't see any out of any other routes uh, to go through. That that's a very that's a very fundamental element of sovereignty. We should we should emphasize this. I, I cannot emphasize this more. This is a, a fundamental element of sovereignty of the country, and uh, this is a prerequisite. I think you cannot leave that aside and do other things. Say like this is not not. This is highly important. This is highly important because you you structure you you structure your positioning based upon such uh, bold moves uh, in the international legal arena. So. Uh, I think I'll stop here because there's a lot to say, but uh, we'll all, we'll, we can hold that for the future. So I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll, well have many other opportunities. Thank you so much, uh, Yerishe. This obviously has been extremely enlightening, and we really do appreciate the time that you've given us to to discuss these uh, this important case. Um, we are literally watching history in the making, and uh, make no mistake, uh, our viewers. This is in some ways our Nuremberg moment, I'll be honest with you. And I think that people, um, as uh, Yerishe is a very soft-spoken sp spoken individual, but let us not underestimate the weight of, uh, of this case, uh, not only on, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the in international law, legal jurisprudence, but also uh, in the exercise of sovereignty and the protection of our own rights as Armenians. And I think that um, with that, I want to, uh, before I pass it on to Garo for his last comments, I want to give it back to Yerusha if he has any last words before we wrap it up for today. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karnik. Uh, I think, um, I think I've said enough, and, but uh, for the last couple of words, um, uh, this is, this is a really, truly important moment for the country. And I think um, uh, whether I think whether Armenians I think agreeing with this cause of action or not disagreeing with this cause of action, I think we should understand that the country is already in a uh, in a, in a legal proceedings. And I think in understanding this, we knew, we really need to uh, I think uh, like uh, structure our attitude and our contact in, in in that manner, like not to not to harm the process. Because it's really a very important process for the country, and that, that's my that's my last word that I wanted just to put out there. Because uh, of course I know that there will there'll be people that you might not agree with why we did that, but I think it's there is a lot of merit into doing this. A lot, I think there is uh, agreeing this or disagreeing. But uh, since it has been done, I think we should um, we should be supportive of this process, all of us. That, that, that's highly important. Thank, Thank you, Yerisha. And I think uh, I want to just echo the fact that we should all stand behind this extremely big step um, for our nation. This is a, a significantly uh, uh, consequential step. And I commend again, Yerisha, and your team for the, the work that has gone into this. It is by no means a small feat. Uh, the undertaking is a is such a significant one. It is an extremely heavy lift, and I have to say, I commend you again on how artfully it's been done. Um, and uh, we will obviously stand behind you and support the endeavor, monitor the endeavor, and we hope that our viewers uh, will heed that um, that call, uh, get behind the case, 
uh, and as some of our viewers had asked about the public uh, relations standpoint of it to spread information about the case, not only its substance, but its very importance. And I think that by doing that, we would have unified behind a movement that is extremely important, not only to our present, but also to our future. And uh, with that, I want to pass it on to Garo for his last words. Thank you. Five days, five days before the 30th anniversary of the independence of Republic of Armenia, Republic of Armenia filed in the International Court of Justice the application instituting proceedings and requests for provisional measures, Republic of Armenia versus Republic of Azerbaijan, volume one. In the last paragraph of that, of that application, paragraph number 138 reads, I have the honor to assure the court of my highest esteem and consideration. Signed by Yerisha Giragosyan, agent of Republic of Armenia at The Hague, 16th of September, 2021. First, let me thank you, Yerisha, for carrying the flag to The Hague, for carrying this to The Hague. When we talk about Independence Day, we talk about freedom, we talk about freedom that is achieved on self-reliance, exercising sovereignty. Sovereignty, which Carnage referred to early in the program, which you, Yerisha, agreed with. Sovereignty equals liberty. And sovereignty and liberty is a nonpartisan concept. I want everybody to understand that there is no politics in sovereignty and liberty. So when people go about finding an opportunity to politicize an exercise of sovereignty, people are not being true champions of freedom, true champions of independence, or honoring the Independence Day, the Independence Day that was, that was given to us, bestowed upon us, in 1918, in 1991, and that which is being protected today in the highest court around the globe. This is how you reach your objectives. This is how you take back control and you are taking back control for all of us, Yerishe. There are battlefields to be fought with weapons and there are battlefields to be fought with minds. The courtroom is a place for minds to engage in battle. True freedom, true freedom, I said it at the beginning, is accepting and believing that you and you alone must be responsible for your life. This is the foundation and the spirit upon which our homeland was built. We have struggled for thousands of years for this, for the right to be sovereign and speak as a sovereign among a League of Nations. This is real independence. So if there was going to be a silver lining, a gift on the 30th anniversary of the Republic of Armenia, where we have unfortunately foreign armies, you know, infiltrating our sovereign territories, this is how you go, aside from the battlefield, this is how you go and seek redress and you fight back. Folks, let's commit and recommit to real independence. Let's stop this nonsense about this is not the right thing, that is the wrong thing, this is the right thing, that is the wrong thing. Um, I'll Yerbu Azar Dastavetsin, I'll Aroria Sahmanain Zenki Gradotsteri Hedevan Krov, Arsak Yan Sharjumi, Mercharten Verabro, Hazainar Dastut Gerdo, Angahutian, Hanun Hishadat Neri, Hanun Ein Viravor Vazderibor, I saw 
կոյադևեն արսախի եւ հայաստանի մեջ հանուն իրենց զնողներին հանուն անոնք որոնք երապլուրի մեջ գնենչեն եկեք այդ զողողությունը մենք իզուր չթարսնենք ոչ թե միայն բադերազմի թաշկի վրա ինչու չէ բադերազմի թաշկի վրա ինքնապաշտպանության համար ինչքան որ պետք է սակայն աշխարհի փարսակույն թադարաններու մեջ եթե մեր ցայնը լսելի չթարսնենք իրավունք չունենք մենք անգախության դեր լինելու բայց մենք իրավունք ունենք անգախության դեր լինելու եւ անգախության դերն ենք եւ երիշե your generation is one that ought to be proud of from the soldiers that went heroically at the age of 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 and then us and then some but the new generation your colleagues from the arman tatoyans and everybody else from geram up there in arsakh from ruben melikian uh, the predecessor of artak petarian and everybody else regardless of their political or or uh, party affiliations i don't care when you are speaking for this you are speaking for independence day you are speaking for sovereignty and i thank you for it yerisha whatever you need you know where to find us you have a blessed day brother thank you thank you thank you karo thanks a lot thank you karnik i appreciate thank it. you yerisha <laughs> party okay. happy independence day thank you happy independence day